I know that we just said beauty, but a person that actually brings a moreness to our life and to lives is Mary Grace. She is a conduit of compassion, a force of goodness, the embodiment of service. And Mary Grace opens up her vessel of love to fill others' cups. She hosts circles in her home for over, uh, I believe, 15 years. She's brought countless women together to claim new lives for themselves. She's the sole emergency room. She brings about connection like no other. And we are so absolutely honored to hear anything when she wants to uh, do a presentation. And we just love her so much. We could do a whole morning of gratitudes and grace for our Mary Grace. So taking it away, Mary Grace. Thank you so much. So, so nice. So living in the not knowing. Um, I really want to share just my personal life journey and some experiences to just kind of open things up because what I'd like would be to welcome group sharing. Now, uh, just so you're all aware, this is being recorded. So anything that you decide that you want to share will be posted on our YouTube channel. Thank you, Dana. So just, uh, just to let you know that. Um, you know, I purposely on my speaker form, I wrote a lot more than I normally would because my hope was that maybe somebody will read it and it may kind of stir up some of your own thoughts and, uh, and experiences about it that you may choose to share later on this morning. So my own personal healing journey has taken me to some strange and bizarre places. In 1998, I experienced a kundalini awakening, which seems to have evolved into a shamanic energy that's present in my body now. I've experienced having visions, hearing voices at times. Along with kundalini awakening, I had traumatic childhood sexual abuse memories surface, as well as an alien abduction. I wondered, how could I not have these childhood memories before now? How could I have vivid childhood memories of other events and not these? This made it even more difficult for me to believe that any of it was true. I was driven for years. I was driven to know the truth. If events that are still vivid in my mind actually took place in this third dimensional reality, or if they were just in my imagination, I felt I had to come to this place of not knowing literally to save my sanity. It was very intense. What I know now is that these non-ordinary experiences and childhood memories are vivid in my mind. But what they actually are, I hold in that space of not knowing. I choose not to define them. This is a short poem I've written in the book that I'm writing that, that kind of reflects this. And it's called, I Live in the Not Knowing. What is all this, these memories in me? I don't know. I only know that they are vivid in my mind. Are they simply in my psyche? Are it passed down through my DNA? Or are they archetypal images as described by Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell? Are they from other dimensions or realities? Are they from other times? Or did they happen in the current lifetime? Or is it all just my imagination? I live in the not knowing. I hold reality loosely because from there I can watch it all. I live in surrender to it all. And this brings me peace. I do my best to not have beliefs. And of course I do have some belief, but what I know is that the fewer beliefs I have enables me to see more clearly rather than just see the facts that support my beliefs. I am more able to live a larger life. I am a skeptic, and I mean this using the original definition of collecting data, but not coming to a conclusion. This means accepting the data without defining it. Sadly, in today's world, the word skeptic is defined very differently. Many use this word to scoff at others' experiences and ideas. 
They come to their conclusion of what is right, and what is wrong, and their right answer concretizes their beliefs to only be able to see what they have already decided is the right conclusion. It blinds them to anything other than what they have decided is true. The true skeptic is inclusive, which I strive to be. And this opens the awareness to discover more possibilities. Rather than the exclusive this or that, now I see it all as all of the above. I choose this inclusive approach rather than exclusive because that excludes possibilities. What has been very helpful for me is to find the concept of the imaginal realm that Carl Jung spoke about. I noticed how uncomfortable I have been with even this term because it sounded like the dismissive expression that I used to say to myself, oh, it's only your imagination. The imaginal realm is a subtle realm between matter and waking consciousness. It bridges the gap between consciousness and the unconscious mind. I have read in several places that Jung had so many numinous, numinous experiences that he was flooded with them. And he was concerned about getting disconnected from this grounded material world. The imaginal realm then is that container to hold his experiences. This was really uh, a, a lifesaver for me so that um, I could live more peacefully and also live a larger life where I could see more. So I would just, uh, rather than share more of my own experiences, I would love to hear other people's um, thoughts and, uh, and perhaps experience with this idea. Lori. I'm speaking because if I don't talk now, then I maybe it's just hard for me to talk. So I had an experience uh, on Friday when I was walking the labyrinth. And I had lots of images and I felt energy. I first walked, when I first walked into, I just didn't, it was kind of at the unnaughty. It's like, okay, well, I'll just do it. Done it before. <laughs> and with the images, um, with energy, with different things that I saw, all I know is, is that um, I could call it past lives that got coagulated all together, or just something inside me that needed to be seen or aspects. But all I know is when I finished it and I completed it, I felt so much stronger and were solid. And I needed to take time afterwards to go out and sit and have some and quiet and have some food to to just um, digest it. And as it still is um, assimilating in me. So I'm not sure what we, we what I can call it. And I, I guess that's what I was being with was that I'm not going to necessarily label it as much as all yeah. I know is I feel much stronger because of it. And that's what I wanted to share is that um, it was a lot for me and it created goodness. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Lori. Michael. Um, I did present to this group a number of uh, presentations based upon the, uh, the book Trickster Makes This World, which was all about Hermes, the... Uh, the uh, pagan god, which survives to this day. I mean, Hermes is still around. But one of the interesting things, when I was at UCLA, I took a number of courses in myth and religions. And uh, what happened? Did I lose you? No, uh, you're good. Yeah, my screen went strange here. Oh, we can see you and hear you. Okay, well, one of the Studying myth and religions that was interesting was the professor talked a lot about how pagan gods like Hermes or other ones would manifest to their manifest in 
and have an extremely present present a great presence to people where they would see and relate their experiences of the god actually having met them and and you'd ha have these accounts of people saying that the god appeared to them and did all these very real things and it was like they didn't make it up they actually lived it in their dream state and i thought that was really interesting about how people would um, in ancient times have these extremely realistic experiences um, but they weren't in their own mind made up. They actually believed the God visited them uh, corporeally, like the God came down and visited and talked to them and everything else, but it was all, in effect, a dream visit. Um, I don't know where that fits, where you're going with this, Mary Grace, but that's one thing that occurred to me. You know, I um, I didn't include others of my own experiences because I wanted to give space for other people, but just as a kind of an addendum to what I'm hearing you say, Michael, um, I was raised in metaphysics. So I always assumed that stories I read in the Bible were all metaphors. And people having out-of-body travel, that was a metaphor. All those kinds of impossible things were metaphors. And then I started having my own personal experiences of what I call the more or the non-ordinary. And I had to adjust that. And that's what kind of threw me into the place of what's the truth? What's really true? What's really happening? Is this my imagination? Is it really happening? And I really am, have become very comfortable in the place of, um, I absolutely do have a belief. It's one of my beliefs that I have that people who describe experiences really do have those. Now, what they actually are we don't know what well, the experiences are that I have. I don't define, I don't know, but they're absolutely vivid in my mind and in my experience. And I trust that that's true for other people too. The difference is holding it as uh, the impossible happens because it, it does um, and not defining it not closing it into a small box of here's what it is. Well, the only thing I'm suggesting, and I think this happens, you know, when you realize this is that the presence of, in the case, in this case, the, the, the God, God Hermes is a good example is the presence of the narrative, the presence of the, you know, the, the thing in the culture where people see this all around can allow people to, in effect, complete it and personalize it, and it becomes alive in them. And they make it up in their life. They they create it in the, in themselves. Um, and it manifests. And, and Yeah. And I have no argument with that. Maybe. My yeah. response to all of it is, maybe that's so. Yeah. I, I, hold, I hold it all. I do my best to hold it yeah. all. Anyway, that's that's my reaction to one of the things you're saying. Sure, thank you, thank you, Bill. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mary Grace. Uh, yeah, I was thinking about a lot of things um, in the uh, transcendental, I guess, revelations that kind of area. Um, I do. I'm sorry. Tim is not here because I'd have to credit him uh, definitely for having invited me to uh, an ayahuasca ceremony uh, once that was that was just where I had a vision. I had a vision as a result um, and became a believer, I guess, as a result. And uh, that was a, that was a first time experience. It was uh, it was eye opening, mind opening. And um, I also just wanted to throw a little context in here, which I learned recently I was fascinated by uh, the US before we, you know, became a country. Uh, they did some research. They did some uh, <laughs> uh, Ben Franklin and Alexander Hamilton uh, went up to visit uh, the Iroquois and uh, to see how they organized their their government and so forth. They went to sweat lodges and, 
you know, how decisions were made and whatever. And they, they kind of took away some of the, I guess what, what Europeans might consider uh, woo woo stuff, but they brought back something that they, they used to form the Articles of Confederation, which is a precursor to uh, our constitution. So they found a practical aspect out of, out of this, um, which was very useful. And that, that to me, it just kind of, um, listen, you know, we consider them founding fathers and all that, but, but they had, they had that exploration, uh, the ability to explore and be open-minded and to, and to learn things. So I, anyway, that just uh, impressed me. And I, I want to maintain that kind of uh, openness. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Um, let's see, Mavira. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, I I have um, an acceptance of the mystery of life and things that happens. Yeah. Um, I believe we all have them. It's a matter of attunement and receptivity, and what we do with it. And I, I'll give a couple of examples. Um, when my son died, he was in Atlanta, Georgia. And on my plane ride to go back there and take care of the necessities of reality, a form of reality, I was gifted on the flight with a um, life review of our time together and the time that he shared. <clears throat> and it came gently and it came in a loving, supportive way. And um, it soothed my soul. It comforted me. And at the same time, the airplane was circling to land and had dumped its fuel and he couldn't get clearance to land. And people in the airplane were panicking and screaming and a lot of chaos broke out. And I was held in grace. I was held in a place of um, comfort and love. And it was like I was facing death of my son. And there I was facing my own death, uh, mm -hmm. being dumped in the Atlantic. And yet there was an element, a presence. There was something else. I think we walk with that something else all the time. I think it is forever there with us. If we're open to it and if we're listening and if we can be quiet enough inside and slow down. And I have, I have worked and endeavored to do that. And another time I was living in Studio City. I was walking down an alley and no one else was out there. And I became aware that there were three ruffians, for lack of a better word, that were surrounding me. And I, it occurred to me that I was in danger and I was in between buildings in this alley. So there was really no place for me to go. There was no exit. And they were closing in on me. And I heard a voice in my head that said, raise your hand and wave. And I, me, I started arguing. It's like, what? What? And it was, it got insistent, raise your hand and wave, which I started waving like crazy. My son was meeting me across the street. And as I was waving, I got to the end of the building. He started waving and hollering back and the three dispersed immediately. Wow. I wasn't alone. I wasn't surrounded. And again, I, and I have goosebumps all over my body. Yeah. There is that mystery that is loving and supporting and kind. And it may not always present itself that way initially. So I've shared in this group many times before, my mantra is thank you for this healing. I don't have to understand it. I don't have to be able to identify it. What I do know is my life has been transformed. These are two examples. My life has been repeatedly transformed and it has always been constructive and loving and challenging and sometimes a white knuckle. You know, it's like you just white knuckle it and I don't, I don't get it, 
and I appreciate your what you said, Mary Grace, about you don't have a belief around it. It's like it is virtually, in my experience, undefinable, okay. but recognizable at the same time. Okay. Thank you for letting me share. We uh, thank you very much, Levita. We do have a lineup of people to share, so I really appreciate that. Um, so we have uh, Thomas ready to go. I, I'd like to uh, speak here. Uh, thank you, Lovita. That's really uh, such a great example of living in the mystery, not defining it, not boxing it in. It is there, whatever it is in the mystery. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think Thomas was next. Yes. Thanks, Mary Grace. Uh, thanks, Michael. Um, thanks, Levita. <clears throat> this is a, a an old and a deep question. Um, the not knowing is the, the opposite of not knowing is, is maybe knowing. And so the opposite of not knowing is thinking that I know. It's mm -hmm. believing that I know. And uh, I originally typed out in the Myers-Briggs as strong on the J, judgment, which is indication that I think I know. And later when I typed out, I was uh, pretty far out into the P, which is perception, which is not judging, but open to new information in my understanding. And so when I think about my journey from being certain to, to being willing to not know, several things stand out. I used to be obsessed with the question of what is true. And like somehow I could figure it out and I would know it and I could prove it. Yeah. And I would be certain about what was real. Yeah. But I just couldn't get the ground to firm up under that question. It just kept it dissolving under me. Yeah. And one of the things that happened was that uh, I had a spontaneous visit from Jesus. And it was, it was so complete and so real that I had no question about its reality and its truth. And that helped open me up some to the realm of that which I had not previously believed possible. And the second was, and I may have told this story before, but I had a client when I was uh, a psychologist in Palo Alto. And I, I got a uh, the opportunity to get a reading from a psychologist who was also a psychic up in Berkeley, Helen Palmer. And when I walked into the waiting room, I I was a, a skeptic in the old sense. You know, I, I don't think it's true. You have to prove to me that it is true. That was my stance in life. But then I had such an obligation to my client to get the consultation that I intentionally put myself in the place of I am believing, I'm willing to believe that this psychic stuff works. And then that opened a door for me, that one decision to just be willing to try on believing instead of testing. And uh, I got very deeply involved in the psychic community in Northern California as a result. And I, I th the punchline for this is that I also worked for 30 years with women of color doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And I discovered through that, that it was really my cultural inheritance to believe that I knew the right answer to things. That was so strongly cultural in me as a white guy that uh, it took layers and layers and layers of unlearning that I already knew what I needed to know. And I'll be forever grateful to the those women who were so patient with me as I learned to not be so sure of what I knew and be so sure that I was right about what I knew. So those, I mean, this triggers a very deep conversation that stretches back over my entire intellectual life. Yeah. Thank you for opening it up. Yeah, I'm thank you, Thomas. Yeah, I, I can so relate. I, I come from the other skeptic. And, uh, you know, I literally had, I have had visions and experiences with Mary, and I've never been Christian or Catholic, Jesus, and then in India with a number of different gods and goddesses, and um, they 
transformed my life. I became from Linda Schwartz. I became Mary Grace and transformed my life. And, um, you know, the, when I say the not knowing, those things are vivid. Those things happen to me. What they are, I don't know. Were they projections from my psyche? Were they a belief system I'm culturally in? Was it actually visitations from those entities? I live in the not knowing, and then I can appreciate it all. Thank you. Um, Patricia, I think Patricia's next, right? Yes. Um, yeah, we are creatures that we need to understand. We need to give meaning to what we are exposed to. And also we are judgmental creatures, so we can judge ourselves and judge other people's beliefs, which completely narrows our minds. And and I'm I totally I'm in the same place as you. Um is in the between the black and white, it, we are swimming in the gray. And there are all these immense possibilities without labeling. The minute one starts labeling or yeah. thinking, oh, I got it, that's when our mind becomes narrow. Yeah. And um, I wanted to say so many things and now it escapes my mind. Um, but it, it feels uncomfortable uh mm. when when one feels that one got it and and puts the label it feels like a, a sense of ease but it's actually uh staying in the not knowing and staying in the uncomfortable that yeah. one can perceive better and and even one can increase the perception of things yeah. and that's where um, that's what I'm trying to be every day. Sometimes it's difficult. Mm -hmm. it, it's an everyday thing, but I I appreciate um, your talk because I'm in the same quest. Yeah, thank you, Patricia. Yeah, you know, uh, well, I'll I'll just go on. I mean, I have I have thoughts about what everybody is saying. This is such a close to my heart topic. You know, I uh, yeah, and I and this was true for me. Uh, and I and I see it culturally. Uh, it seems to me that um, if people can explain it away, it becomes concrete. They can explain it away. It's a more familiar place. It's more comfortable. But what happens when that gets blown up? That happened to me. Uh, it's a good thing, but it can be a bitch to go through. So, yeah. Um, Sam. Oh, Sam, we can't hear you. It's very, very soft. Okay. I, there you go. This usually operates all the technical stuff. We're in different rooms today. Uh, but I'm in my own office today. Um, yeah, I wanted to mention, uh, kind of re comment further on uh, what Thomas was saying about uh, perception. Um, you know, we all perceive things, and uh, according to Jung and the Myers Briggs, we receive information through the five senses or through intuition. And, and Jung defined intuition as perception by way of the unconscious. The unconscious can perceive things that the five senses cannot. Um, and you know, I'm a a very have been a very conceptual guy uh, wanting to make, after I perceive something, I want to make a decision about what it was. And uh, one of the great things Mary Grace is continually, I, I'm learning from her is she, she doesn't try to put things in categories or concepts or boxes. She just says, well, that's the experience. And um, that, that that's you know that's a, an important lesson for me and you know it's and even that is in my mind when I was single and dating I put down my religion as experiencing the mystery and I have been able to do that at times but you know it, it, it's hard to 
keep that going to be open to the mystery of life or the, the mystery of a flower that you see and you wonder, well, how did the how did nature create this beautiful flower? And to me, the, the mystery is I see more and more in nature. I don't have as the, the number of I, unusual experiences like Mary Grace, uh, but I increasingly try to see the mystery in, in nature uh, that that I have to work at. And yet when I work at it, there are rewards. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah, Sam, Sam and I, I think have been a good balance for each other. Uh, I remember really well when we were first together and I kind of dared to share the dream about my vision of Mary. His idea was that my mind was like a projection and it projected that image. It was really hard for me to hear, but I knew if I'm going to live in the not knowing, that's one possibility. And it was hard, but I find that the longer I've gone with saying, maybe that's true to everything, the more relaxed and peaceful I am with it. So I really appreciate you brought that to me. <laughs> well, yeah, see, I wanted to put Mary Grace's experience and say it's it's from the unconscious, there's no doubt. And now I don't believe that. It, it may be, as she says, from the unconscious, it may be a, some spirituality <laughs> external to the psyche so yeah. that's living in without knowing and i really admire that in her um linda there you go um when my mom died um she was in a car crash and um, somebody, you know, she was at a stoplight or a stop sign and somebody went through and crushed her. She lived 11 days in the hospital. And I know when she passed, I was there when she passed. I had four dreams, four dreams that came every single night. And the last one was an ascended master. And I'd never heard that before. But I know that she was telling me stuff. And it was really good. Thank you, Linda. Really touching. I remember that. Um, let's see, Hans or Inger? Um, so way back in Denmark, when I grew up during the war, uh, there was always felt like there were two powers that was in my life. There was the one power of good and kept me safe. And then it was the danger, the danger of, you know, walking the street and one of the Nazis would take you and put you away. So it, it was this double thing of, of, of being protected, but at the same time, this other shadow that was always kind of there. And it seemed like in my life, it has kept appearing. Uh, I've always felt for a long time that I sort of was uniquely guided, meaning that somehow there was this entity that somehow, if I listened, just, just uh, made things appear. And so my career and all the stuff I've done really has been me saying I'm here for good and for God. I'm here to be willing and just to show up. And some amazing things have happened. I've, I've gone from one career into another career to this. And still to this day, in my age today, it still feels like it's happening. Um, when I was busy with my clients, uh, one of the things I would do was before I started a session, I would just say, I'm here for good and for God, and to be willing to whatever I heard to do that. And uh, sometimes it was against my ego belief that I, I was this smart, you know, PhD, and I knew stuff. And yet the voice that I heard said for me to do something different. And it was it was really 
a difficult thing for me initially to really trust it. Uh, one glaring example was one young man I was doing guided imagery with and who went into a psychotic state. And he was just really, I was trying to reach him and it was really hard to reach him. And at one point I heard this voice say, let him smell the roses. And I thought, oh my God, <laughs> you know, I mean, how mundane, you know, smell a rose in your office. But I thought, no, I have to listen. And so I made him smell the rose and he put it to his nose and all of a sudden he became completely calm. He said, you know, when I was a little boy, I would have these fits and my grandmother would go and she would take a little thing from the perfume bottle and she would put it under my nose and I would become t totally calm. Mm -hmm. So those kind of things, uh, 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 me not knowing, but me listening has yeah. been a challenge yeah. because I have also this ego that, oh, I know this and I know that and I have all this stuff. And yet there's so much wisdom. I feel that I've been so fortunate in my life to be guided and I feel I still am. So I'm, I'm in awe of that. And uh, it, the guided imagery, doing a Jungian symbolism was my first time of, of, of not me showing off all the stuff I knew, but really just listening to what appeared in the, in the sessions, which was really miraculous. So uh, it was the struggle of, of, of sitting back and allowing things to happen and me trying to want to do what I learned, you know. So it seems that that keeps happening. It's just me trying to be quiet and present and listen. And that other part that wants to do it. Mm. Anyway, thank you for sharing. Let you know, I, Inger, uh, I'm going, I'm literally going to add, I live in the not knowing and I listen. Yeah. Yeah, that's really That's exactly. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, Patricia. I remember what I, I was going to say that uh, when I get uncomfortable with it not knowing, I tell myself I may understand it in a different dimension. I may not have the tools now, but perhaps with different ways of perceiving, I'll get it. Yeah. I say, that helps me. And if I can read a few words by Pema Chodron, um, she said, life is like that. We don't know anything. We call something bad. We call it good. But really, we just don't know. God, that's just perfect. Thank you so much. That's great. Anyone else want to share their thoughts or experiences? Or you don't have to agree, you know, if you disagree. Dana. You know, it's funny that we're talking about this not knowing. Um a while back I got um, I got on this list to get the gratitude, uh, grateful living. Every day I get a different quote. And this one came through recently um, from Yo-Yo Ma. Mm. Every day I move toward that which I do not understand. The result is a continuous accidental learning which constantly shapes my life. Oh my gosh. That's and really wonderful. I just was kind of blown away by somebody who has diversified his classical training into virtually anything that makes music, anything that makes sound, anything that makes mm -hmm. a noise is the world speaking to him and he just disappears into that and it and it's such a powerful mm. powerful lesson to learn from those around us and mm -hmm. so thank you mary grace thank you yeah. very much thank you thank you Hedia. thank you mary grace for this topic i appreciate you and love you and i love when you said our imagination and like for me who am I to argue with it or my dreams uh my sister 
passed away about two and a half years ago. And every now and then I have these beautiful, lovely dreams that we're both young and like not teenagers, young women in our 20s or 30s. And she looks beautiful. We're hanging out and doing stuff together. And I wake up feeling like it was real. Um, and I have a friend that says, who knows, maybe when we sleep in this yeah. in this form, we travel somewhere else and have another life. Um, our spirit travels. Because those dreams are so real to me and I wake up like feeling good and comforted and and maybe they they are in my imagination and just to comfort me because um, I still miss her and desire for her to be alive and here in body. You know, I keep surrendering that and going back and forth. So I appreciate that you mentioned the imagination and our imagination is very powerful and it can be true. I don't know. I can't prove anything wrong or right. And and I love that concept as well. I'm like, who knows? Um, and we learned at USM, if the client believes it's true, then it's true for them. Exactly. And trust them and follow their lead and support their lead, which which I love and I appreciate. And that creates um, a lot of space for acceptance and embracing and understanding. So thank you for this. I, I love when you when you facilitate our group. Thank you. I love you, Mary Grace. Thank you. Thank you, Hedia. Yeah, you know, uh, visitations and dreams are um, a fascination for me. Um, yeah. Oh, Ruth is here. Hi, Ruth. Hi, good morning. morning. Just a small synchronicity is the last thing I listened to last night before I went to sleep was the commencement exercise from a young woman from South Asia, from Harvard. She was the first person of her um, family to receive a college degree, and it was from Harvard, and she gave the commencement exercise, and the entire speech was about the value of uncertainty. Oh my gosh, really? And then, and then, you know, it seems, doesn't seem so strange that that's what you would be talking about today. Um, but, but the last oh. thing I wanted to mention is that there is a tendency um, for those of us who've had extraordinary experiences to somehow think less of or put down or um, people who have not had those experiences or can talk about them or who think that we are living in woo-woo land. And um, I was at a Marianne Williamson lecture once and I was telling her about the fact that my my sister doesn't accept any of these things. She does think that's um, their stories that, you know, they're not real. And she said, be very careful that you don't discredit people who don't accept what happened to you, she said, they are just fine the way they are. We don't have to cause them to change, to feel like we do, to make the world an okay place. And I thought that was a very powerful statement because that, that we tend to gravitate towards people who have had the same kind of experiences we have and very often they're not people in our family. And so sometimes in our family seems that they're alienated from our true essence because they can't, they don't register experiences the way we do. So I just, I just wanted to mention that because there is always that, that danger. And thank you so much for what you and everybody else has shared. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for saying that. You know, it reminds me in the 90s, I had a center, the sacred space, and we had uh, classes and workshops from all different spiritual traditions and personal growth. And a, a pretty common thing was I would hear people say, well, they don't get it. Kind of a superior kind of a thing. And I used to say, what's it? <laughs> what is that? You know, so yeah. So I, I think we're we're pretty much near the end of this. Is oh, there Grace, we we have about five more minutes. I think you oh, could okay. tell 
you know, till 10 minutes to the hour, and then we don't need a lot of time to do the wrap up. Okay. Five more minutes. I don't know if there are others that would like to uh, speak. Paul has his hand Paul. up. Oh, great. Thank you. Paul. Oh. This whole thing about unknowing. Um, when I was a teenager in high school, me and a friend took a canoe trip down a wilderness river. It was two weeks. And what we discovered is we never knew what comes around the next bend in that river. We'd never been down it before. And as the view and the experience of the next bend or the next day unfolded, it was so fresh and beautiful. And of course it was always fresh and beautiful, but you know, after three or four days on the river, you just stop anticipating and start being in the moment. And so it's just that not knowing the world just unfolds in front of you in a way that it's hard to describe. Thank you, Mary Grace, for this talk. Thank you, Paul. What a beautiful view. I can just feel that. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it <clears throat> reminds me in, in a body of uh, personal work that I did in women's groups for years, um, we would separate out data from feelings and there was an expression that I use to this day, and it's called the story I tell myself. Um, my stories seem so real. Mostly they're not. But it helps me to sort of pull things apart. What's data and what's the story I'm telling myself? And that is another thing that I use with the living and the not knowing. It's a story I tell myself. Could be true, maybe, but maybe not to have it separated from the data um, it continues to be really valuable for me with data without defining it hmm. yay Alex please hi, um, hi. Um, Mary Grace I so appreciate the way you you hold it in the the place of not knowing because it, it is it is so difficult <laughs> to to keep yourself open to to the experiences without judging it. It's really not easy. What what uh, I relate with what a lot of you said about the topic in many different ways. But uh, Patricia mentioned how we are creatures of of judgment, right? We like to understand things. We like to. And with understanding comes judgment. <laughs> and but at the same time, we also want to be open to the mystery of life and to and I remember when I growing up, because I I was uh, uh, born, born and raised in Brazil, which is a culture that is very much connected to the to the supernatural experiences and very much open to spiritual life from many different religions and spiritual practices. And I grew up seeing people have having different, going through different uh, spiritual awakenings of different kinds. And, and I remember how much when I was young, how much I judged those experiences. <laughs> And I'm in trying to explain, but not from a judgment of, oh, you are wrong and I'm right because of this, or trying to rationalize, not, not that, but, but trying to understand and to uh, um, how could that be and, and trying to ground the experience somehow. And, but, but the evidence of the mystery was so much bigger than the rational explanation could ever be. So I think as I as I was getting, uh, I remember um, going to the house of, uh, we have a, a spirit, spiritual tradition uh, from the African uh, Brazilian tradition in Brazil, where you go to a house and you, and the people dance, everybody together and they enter an ecstatic, uh, place of ecstatic dancing 
and and they they channel the goddess but they embody the goddess the different goddesses while they are dancing uh and it's an amazing thing to experience and but when i was young i was always questioned is is this person really having this experience or they're just you know and the older i get the more i see um how the more I embrace all these possibilities, you know, the more I accept uh, the variety of experiences that people can have, the more I accept the, the, the imaginal realms, the archetypal experiences. A lot of it also, I'm, I do a lot of dream work from the Jungian uh, point of view. Mm-hmm. And and that alone has opened me so much to to have respect for for the numinous experience for the things that we cannot we cannot uh, understand and we cannot completely name it and and so I I really I really appreciate and admire how you hold it in this sometimes uncomfortable place that it can be between the rational mind and the that wants to understand and the and our spiritual higher self that knows that all know that everything is possible so i really i really Great. well thank you very much uh, alex uh, i think thank we're you, come to uh, wrap it up here so mary grace if you would like to wrap it up and i think we also would like uh, at this point to uh, for the group to say thank you to you for everything so any final words um no no i just appreciate everybody's participation this was a real rich morning for me i actually took some notes to add to to uh, my work so i really appreciate appreciate everyone's um openness and willingness to hear and uh, participate a big hand yay for everybody Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful morning and a wonderful, thought-provoking topic.